You're listening to Straight from the Psychologist's Mouth, a podcast that teaches women in midlife to unapologetically stop silencing their dreams and start designing the lives they want to live in. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie, and as a clinical psychologist of the last two decades and a twice divorced single mother myself, I not only know how hard it can feel heading into midlife, I am living it right here with you. I have taken all the many failed attempts and lessons learned in my own life and combine it with my extensive clinical experience to give you the tools you need to make midlife the best time in your life. No joke. So let's get started. Welcome back, everybody. I sure hope that you have been enjoying these podcasts because I've got to tell you, I have most definitely been enjoying talking to you. Even though it's talking to myself and then talking to you virtually, I really feel like this is my way to, to be in conversation with you. And my topic today is talking about our stories and making connections with other women and why that is such a key component to any successful healing for women in midlife, for any progression um, going forward, designing lives that we really want to be living. We're going to have to be in a community of other women doing the same thing. Otherwise, we'll get real lonely. And Our tendency as women, especially those of us who have been through some trauma, is to overcompensate by being um, the one that's always in charge, the one (laughs) that has it all together. We almost overfunction as a response to the systemic sexism that happens to us. We kind of think that, hey, if I hustle, if I am the best version of myself, if I do better than all of my male counterparts, well, then somebody will see me. And it only gets more difficult as our social currency goes down in age. And for women in midlife, that's what we're up against. So now we're trying to outwit and outsmart and outprove ourselves um, in the workplace with younger coworkers, for instance. We're trying to do it in our community. Communities. Um, for crying out loud, we're trying to do it in the mom groups. If you're a parent, like it's, <laughs> it seems to be cropping up everywhere that you're always trying to prove yourself, always hustling for that worth. And if you're going to break that tide, you're going to have to be in a community of women to support you to do that. That's just the bottom line. We need each other and we need each other in part because people need to know the truth. People need to hear the truth. Other women, just like yourself, need to know they're not the only ones. And I'm telling you, and maybe you've had this experience when you're in a group of women where you just feel connected, like you're heard and seen and understood that you belong. There is not anything, I don't think, that will stop a woman who's in that space with a community around her. So uh, yeah, if we're going to affect any kind of change, then this is what we're going to have to do, right? All right. So I am going to just remind you, if you are enjoying these podcasts, please, if you think to rate and review them, um, I know the algorithms like that <laughs> on Apple podcast and anchor podcast, every place, Spotify, every place that you're finding my podcasts right now. So if you like what you're hearing, please let us know. Rating and reviewing just helps me capture more audience uh, members. And certainly my mission here is to help women in midlife design a life they want to live and break from free, really, from chains that have held them back from doing so. And I mean, what better way than hearing a podcast and 
feeling like, oh my gosh, I think that this, this crazy doc, Natalie, like she's on to something out there. She knows a couple things. Sounds like me. This sounds like my life for crying out loud. I want to reach as many people as I can. And podcasts definitely are one of the ways to do that because I know I am an avid podcast listener as a walker. Um, I love to have something buzzing in my ear while I'm on a good walk. So please rate and review. Now, no further ado, let's get into this. I have been reading a book by, um, I'm going to try and say her name, Dr. Tarare Trent. Uh, and she has written a book called The Awakened Woman. Highly recommend. We'll have it in the notes for the podcast so you can link to this book. Highly recommend it though. She's really talking about trying to light that fire, rekindle that fire of your creativity and really what your purpose is, why you're here in the world, have you really realign with what it is that you want to be doing, that the life you want to be living, not a life that you were told, this is a great life, you should live it. And you've checked all those boxes. We're not talking about that life because we know that you've done that and done it well. What we're talking about is what it is that you want from your own life. And one of the things that she talks about, so you guys are going to understand why I'm talking about Dr. Trent today. One of the things she talks about is how important our stories are and how a, like having a story helps to align us with other women who have had similar experiences and helps to even across cultures across, you know, a much wider population than just ourselves start to bring healing. So I'm going to read a quote from her. She says, our stories need to be told. And there is a richness in our diversity because we are not monolithic. Rather, it is the beauty of our differences that will bring a cross-pollination of great lessons to be learned that will strengthen not just ourselves, but also the world around us. So she's really speaking to this idea that telling our stories, even our vulnerables, are honestly, especially our vulnerable pieces to our stories, really helps first of all, to show that there is this diversity among us. And in that diversity is a beauty that can strengthen our entire world. It really shows the depth that we bring. And I would say that women in midlife really, I mean, how many stories do we have, right? I want you to think about that. Like we have been having these stories told to us, told of us um, for some time, right? And we know the suffering and we also know what we've learned and how we've come back from the suffering. This is something that's unique. It's not in young adulthood as much. I mean, certainly people go through struggle in young adulthood. Don't get me wrong. What I mean is, I mean, we've seen some stuff. We've been through some stuff. We've gone to the mats and we've had to get back up again and several times by this time in our life. And so the wisdom that we really have here is how can one do that, right? How can one do that and why should one do that and where and when and who with whom should one do that? We have some collective wisdom here that we need to be talking, right? But sometimes those vulnerable pieces of us are the very pieces that get silenced, right? Our dreams get silenced. They're, you know, oftentimes marginalized or we're told are just not as worthy as some of the causes that, you know, a patriarchal supremacist, white supremacist society would tell us <laughs> are of more value and not with intention. That's just the system that has been in place for a very long time. We're still up against dismantling that system. And as long as it's in a power, even if you don't think you're participating in it, you are, it, it, it's just part of the game, right? So Another quote that she said is, we might say the world oppresses women by silencing our voices, 
But the inverse is also true. The world suffers in many cases without knowing or acknowledging it, without women's voices. Sacred sisters, that is the power we have to tell stories that deepen and extend human consciousness, that heal our souls, and that can bring a global spiritual and physical healing. What? I mean, her words just sing off the page for me. And I uh, wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Trent. I think that when women start acknowledging one another and hearing their voices with one another and then start to then extend that out into the human consciousness, it it creates change. And I'm going to case in point, and I'll try to send a link for this as well. Um, I think it's called She Said or She Says. Uh, There is a, a new movie, I believe through NBC or Peacock or something of that nature. You, there is this movie about, the movement that happened when people started to report the sexual abuse, sexual assault, sexual harassment by Harry or Harvey Weinstein. What was his name? I don't even remember his name. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> Harvey, I think it is. Doctor, or it's not Doctor uh, Harvey Weinstein it was a producer in Hollywood, and as people started to come forward, and it took some doing, it created a tidal wave. And it wasn't just with what happened because of a result of him. I think if you remember correctly, you started to see several men in the public eye um, start to be called on their poor sexual behaviors in the workplace, their sexual harassment in the workplace, which doesn't always have to have a sexual connotation to it. It is sometimes just the sexism itself. Um, There was like a reckoning that began. So you can see how it starts small with just saying our piece, speaking our piece. I think the original article only quoted about, you know, four different people. Of course, Ashley Judd was one of them. And so that was certainly why it got the notoriety that it did, but it created this tidal wave. I mean, absolute tidal wave of change that continues to this day. And that is a really great example of why we need to stop being silenced and start to tell our stories. And here's the thing I know about women. Ask a woman who has had a child about her birth story when she had her child. And you will get an earful. I'm not lying to you. (laughs) Ask, you know, a group of women that, and you've got a full on conversation for hours where we just keep reliving that, that we went into labor and then this happened and then this happened and then this kiddo came or I had to go and have an emergency C-section. I ask them and you will be pulled in to a, a litany of details in this conversation. So women know the power of talking about suffering and owning suffering and then actually feeling like transcended from that. Now, obviously with birth stories, you know, many, many times that the joy is on the other end of it, there is a child. Sometimes uh, that's not very joyful. People do have postpartum depression. However, (laughs) it's a, it's an easier version of suffering to be commiserating with other women about when the end game was a positive one. However, this is why I think that women in midlife are poised to really help us with their stories because yes, we've had suffering and we are in a part of our life where we have transcended that suffering. Many of us, many of us have learned how to muscle through it and why it was such a gift, why our discomfort was such a gift and how it helped us to grow. And that essentially is what women are doing when they're all talking about these birth stories that they have. And it's so cool. I've had a couple in recent history where it's it's cool now. I, I know enough people like that have adopted or when it's a um, same sex couple and they're talking about their birth story, which could have been with a surrogate. It could have been with one of the partners. It's like so neat to hear people talk about it, but it is a trial. It is something that is difficult to get through. Uh, Yeah, I've done it twice. Difficult to get through, and yet 
we want to share that and we want to feel equal even in our diversity. We feel heard and seen and understood in our stories when we talk to other women with their stories. We exchange information. I want to hear you. I'm invested and a good steward of listening and believing your story for what you're telling me. And you are invested and a good steward of listening and believing in the story that I'm telling you. And it is that kind of psychological safety that occurs um, in conversations like this that will create the tidal wave that you saw um, with you know, what the movie was showing you um, happened after these women came forward about the sexual harassment at Miramax. So, and sexual assaults. Um, So I want to talk about this a little bit more because I do think, and I've written some blogs about this. I'll also link that, but I do think that there is just a real gift and guidance that comes from our stories of suffering, they are great equalizers. So I don't really care what walk of life you come from, what level of marginalization, oppression, or privilege you come from. When you're commiserating on a a topic of suffering with somebody else, you feel heard and understood at a very guttural, visceral level much more quickly than listening to somebody fill you in on their life story as like a a topical, right? So if you asked me, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself, Dr. Natalie, and I just go through, well, I was born and raised in Minnesota, and here's what I did for school, and later I worked in group homes, and then I went back to grad school, and then I started with the state hospital system, and I worked there, and then I worked in community mental health. If I started to tell you my human doingness, it, it, it doesn't engage us, and it doesn't help you feel heard and seen, right? You're just hearing me give you my autobiography, essentially. So what happens in these birth story kind of moments and what can happen when we talk about our suffering and vulnerability is that we feel heard and seen without the person ever even touching us. I could say it here on the radio waves of the podcast and you might be sitting at home and think, oh my gosh, That's exactly what I've been through and feel heard and seen and understood by somebody you've never met me, right? So how does that happen though? Like what's the difference or the quality of the story? Well, that usually is because at the root of it, it's about suffering. And so there's so much more than what's in the language, right? There's so much more than just what we're saying in the words, So I have been through some significant grief in my lifetime. I became a therapist at the same time that I lost both of my parents uh, about nine months apart. So, and for different reasons, different terminal illnesses and uh, not related to each other at all. They weren't even married at the time they were divorced Uh, And lived in two different states, but I lost my parents nine months apart from one another. And I, you know, really had to reckon with that level of, of grief and being orphaned in my early thirties as I was progressing as a therapist. And I've since then become a, a bit of a specialist in the grief realm or topic because it, because of its significance, because of its importance And what I was recognizing is that having grief over something, it doesn't even have to be people, but having grief over something and hearing someone's grief story is a real equalizer and a real connector that we somehow feel more heard and seen when I say, yeah, I took care of my mom for three years after a diagnosis of renal clear cell carcinoma. Uh, what? Like then people, you know, well, I, I had a family member with, with cancer as well. And it's all of a sudden you feel heard and seen and known on a much different level with the person that you're talking with. than if you're just like, Hey, fill me in, tell me about yourself. That's very topical. What we notice is our humanity in these conversations. What we notice is the equanimity of our lived experiences. 
So it won't matter if my story has to do with my parents passing nine months apart from one another and your story is the loss of your home and job and life related to a divorce. I know what grief like that looks like and feels like, and I can be a good steward of your story and believe how your experience was very similar as I listened to it. Not unlike how women talking their birth stories with one another feel in those moments. It's like only people that have been there would know. And, and that suffering really becomes that equalizer. It shows us our humanity and it also shows us our strength. I'm here telling you this story, right? I'm here with you right now. And I'm saying, this is the grief that I've experienced in my lifetime. And it really shaped who I am. And if you've had significant grief in your lifetime, now you feel connected with me in some way. Like there's some, there's some connection here, even though we're very diverse, probably diverse in the losses that we've had that created that grief, but for certain, just diverse period. Cause we all are so individual and yet we feel this I'm heard and seen peace. So I'm going to go back to what I was talking about as we started today's podcast. I really believe that one of the most powerful tools in moving ourselves through healing is feeling like we belong. And we're literally wired neurobiologically to want to belong and to have our people in our life, introverted, extroverted, doesn't matter to me. You have to have some amount of people that you feel connected to. And when we're in our suffering, we can feel the most isolated, even from the people that are the people we would say are our people. When we don't feel heard and seen and understood, that is probably one of the most isolating and lonely moments in our life. It's one of the reasons we push away from these very difficult emotions that come with things like grief and suffering of any kind. We don't want to feel alone. We want to feel the same, same as everybody else. We liken that to uh, feeling that we belong. And yet counterintuitively in sharing our vulnerability, we will actually make stronger connections with one another. I promise you, it is always the case. I've watched it in grief group after grief group after grief group. I've honestly, even in other kinds of therapy groups that I've run before, just in support groups have seen people really interconnect based on their the equanimity of, of I've suffered and you've suffered, even if the stories are very different. So I want women in midlife to find other women in midlife to be talking to. And they're there folks. They're right next to you. I promise (laughs) there's enough of us going around, right? You can, uh, not throw a rock and not hit somebody that knows somebody at least, um, but that isn't all themselves in midlife or a woman in midlife. I, I think that what we need here is to build some community and to normalize this experience of sharing our stories and seeing our great strength through suffering. And that if we want to start and design lives that we want to live, we're going to have to hear the stories of how people suffered through discovering how to design lives they want to live. We're not going to just do it straight out the gate and know how to do it. And we certainly are going to um, fall back a few steps and then step forward a few, (laughs) fall back two steps and then step forward, maybe four more. It's a slow progress that has a lot of learning in it. That means we're going to fall down several times before we learn how to walk. And what better than a community of people around you to keep your eye on that prize, that eye on, I'm designing this life for myself though. So I'm supposed to be falling down right now because I don't know how to get there quite yet. And sometimes I need to sit and listen to somebody else's story where they say they fell down that way too. 
and it looked different and it was under a different context and with different levels of resource. However, I feel heard and seen and understood. And it doesn't have to mean that you're sitting down with women just directly in your life. Although I encourage that I do. I also think that you can get this kind of community online. And I think that COVID really showed us the ingenuity of we need to create community in different of different levels and scales so that we always feel connected. And we've got these little mini computers in our pockets called cell phones uh, and smartphones. It, some of them look like gall darn tablets. <laughs> my, my, one, my brother has a new Samsung flip, but it's it's like two iPhones side by side when it flips open, it's legit a square tablet. I don't, I'm whatever. I mean, we're old and need to see big print. So (laughs) me and my siblings, so I can see why he has to have that. But anyway, I, I digress, but we have these computers in our pockets and, and there is always a way to create connection that way. So I offer out, of course, learn to love your the free group coaching that I'm going to be doing all of 2023. And it comes with it. An online community one um, lives on Facebook, but for those of us that don't do Facebook, I have a whole other um, community within the course room uh, website that I use. So if you are interested in meeting other women that are struggling along and trying to make this work, you know, join something like that. Google, you know, the Googler is good. Google midlife women support groups, see what you can find. But at the very least, maybe just mention, you know, I'm struggling here. Midlife kind of sucks. Like I'm a mom that's 46 with a seven-year-old and it's a little tougher for me (laughs) to stay up on the 20 bazillion things that we're supposed to stay up on right now. And you might hear from another mother that's in that same boat. Oh, I, I hear and see and understand you. Listen to my part. Yes. I have a story that's very, very similar. And you start to realize that we are not so isolated. We are not alone in this. We do not have to figure all of this out on our own. We have a plethora of wisdom just around us everywhere. We have to figure out how to access it. And some of that will take some uncomfortable searching and trying, you know, maybe an online group, it works. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe an in-person support group would work. Maybe therapy would work. Maybe, you know, joining some sort of community volunteer. It doesn't really matter where you find. You need to start telling your story and you need to start hearing your story and other people's stories. And that, my friends, will create that collective, that collective suffering that turns into strength, that collective humanity where you feel understood and heard and seen. Okay, I'm going to end with one more quote from our lovely Dr. Terere Trent. She's talking here about how even though we come from very diverse backgrounds and our circumstances for our vulnerable stories might be different, this is what she says about it. The distance between these women collapses, as do geographical, political, and cultural borders that may divide them. Our stories have power because through them, we embrace our collective vulnerability and worthiness. When you share your pain and resilience and I share mine, we become one. So I'll leave you with that. Have a great rest of your week. Keep following me. Like I said, also rate and review this podcast if it's something that you're enjoying so that I can get more of them out there and get my word out to more women so that we can be one, so that we can collectively be sharing our suffering and our strength, our vulnerabilities and our worthiness and start not to feel so isolated in our experiences. Have a great day and keep following me so you too can learn to love your story. 